So chapter 6, verse 1 to 24, we'll be reciting. Okay. Om Namo Bhagwate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagwate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagwate Vasudevaya. Dhyan Yoga. Shri Bhagwan Nuvacha. Anashitaha Karma Falam. Karyam Karma Karotiyaha. Sasanyasi Sasanyasi cha yogi cha na niragirna chakriyaha. The Supreme Personality of Godhead said, One who is unattached to the fruits of his work and who works as he is obligated is in the renounced order of life. And he is the true mystic, not he who lights no fire and performs no duty. Text 2. Yam sanyasa mita prahur, yogam tam vidhi pandava, nahi sanyasta sankalpo, yogi bhavati kashchana. What is called renunciation, you should know to be the same as yoga, or linking oneself with the Supreme, O son of Pandu, for one can never be a yogi unless he renounces, the desire for sense gratification. Aru Rokshor Munir Yogam Karma Karana Muchate Yoga Rurasya Tasyaiva Shamah Karana Muchate. For one who is a neophyte in the Eightfold Yoga system, work is said to be the means. And for one who is already elevated in yoga, cessation of all material activities is said to be the means. Text 4. Yadahi nindriyartheshu na karma svanushchate sarva sankalpa sanyasi yoga rurasta dochyate. A person is said to be elevated in yoga when, having renounced all material desires, he neither acts for sense gratification nor engages in fruitive activities. Text 5. Uddhare dhatmanatmanam natmanam vasadaye atmeva yatmano bandhu atmeva ripuratmanaha One must deliver himself with the help of his mind and not degrade himself. The mind is the friend of the conditioned soul and his enemy as well. Text 6. Panduratmatmanastasya yenatmevatmanajitaha anatmanastu shatrutve vartetatmeva shatruvat. For him who has conquered the mind, the mind is the best of friends, but for one who has failed to do so, his mind will remain the greatest enemy. Text 7. Jitat manaha prashantasya paramatma samahitaha shitoshra sukha dukkheshu tatha mana pamana yo. For one who has conquered the mind, the super soul is already reached, for he has attained tranquility. To such a man, happiness and distress, heat and cold, honor and dishonor are all the same. Text 8. Jnana Vigyana Triptatma Kutasto Vijendriyata Vijetin Tendriyaha Yukta Ichyutyate Yogi Samaloshtrashma Kachanaha a person is said to be established in self-realization and is called a yogi or mystic when he is fully satisfied by, by virtue of acquired knowledge and realization. Such a person is situated in transcendence and is self-controlled. He sees everything, whether it be pebbles, 
stones or gold as the same. Text time. Surin Mitra Yudasi Nam Madhyastha Desha Bandushu Sadushwa Picha Papeshu Sama Buddhir Vishishyate A person is considered still further advanced when he regards honest well wishes, affectionate benefactors, the neutral, mediators, the envious, friends and enemies, the pious and the sinners, all with an equal mind. Yogi Yunjita Satatama Atmanam Rahasi Sitaha Ekaki at Chittatma Nirashira Pripari Graha. A transcendentalist should always engage his body, mind, and self in relationship with the Supreme. He should live alone in a secluded place and should always carefully control his mind. He should be free from desires and feeling of possessiveness. Text 11 and 12. Shucho de sho pratishthapya Sira masana matmanaha Natyu chritam nati nicham Jaila jinakushottaram to practice yoga, one should go to a secluded place and should lay kusha grass on the ground and then cover it with a deer skin and a soft cloth. The seat should be neither too high nor too low and should be situated in a sacred place. The yogi should then sit on it very firmly and practice yoga to purify the heart by controlling his mind, senses and activities and fixing the mind on one point. Text 13 and 14. Samam kaya shiro grivam dharayanna chalam sthiraha sampreksya nasika gram swam one should hold one's body, neck and head erect in a straight line and stare steadily at the tip of the nose. Thus, with an unagitated, subdued mind devoid of fear, completely free from sex life, one should meditate upon me within the heart and make me the ultimate goal of life. Text 15. Yunjanevam sadatmanam yogi niyatamanasaha shantim nirvana paramama <laughs> Practicing constant control of the body, mind and activities, the mystic transcendentalist, his mind regulated, attains the kingdom of God or abode of Krishna by cessation of material existence. Text 16. Natyashna tastu yogista there is no possibility of one's becoming a yogi or arjuna if one eats too much or eats too little, sleeps too much or does not sleep enough. Text 17. Yukta hara viharasya. He who is regulated in his habits of eating, sleeping, recreation and work can mitigate, mitigate all material pains by practicing the yoga system. Yada viniyatam chittam Atmanyeva vatishtate 
निस्पृहसर्वकाभ्यो युक्त तदा When the yogi, by practice of yoga, disciplines his mental activities and becomes situated in transcendence, devoid of all material desires, he is said to be well established in yoga. Next nineteen. Yatha dipo nivatastho negate so pamasmrita yogi no yat chittasya. Yunjato yoga matmana. As a lamp in a windless place does not waver, so the transcendentalist, whose mind is controlled, remains always steady in his meditation on the transcendent self. Text twenty to twenty-three. Yatro paramate chittam nirodham yoga sevaya. यत्र दुखे न In the stage of perfection called trance or samadhi, one's mind is completely restrained from material mental activities by practice of yoga. This perfection is characterized by one's ability to see the self by the pure mind. and to relish and rejoice in the self in that joyous state one is situated in boundless transcendental happiness realized through transcendental senses established thus one never departs from the truth and upon gaining this he thinks there is no greater gain being situated in such position one is never shaken even in the midst of great greatest difficulty This indeed is actual freedom from all miseries arising from material contact. Text twenty-four. Sa nishchaye na yo tvakyo yogo nirvana na cheta saha sankalpa prabhavan kama stasya yaktwa sarva na shet shataha. One should engage oneself in the practice of yoga with determination and faith, and not be deviated from the path. One should abandon, without exception, all material desires born of mental speculation, and thus control all the senses on all sides by the mind. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, thank you so much, Anju Mata Ji and Chetna Mata Ji for stepping in like this. <clears throat> It's actually really nice that you, uh, you know, spontaneously uh, volunteered to recite because I know a lot of people uh, worry about reciting the Sanskrit shloka. So it was really nice. Thank you, Anju Mata Ji. Thank you, Chetna Mata Ji, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mata Ji, and uh, sorry for for my mistakes. No, that's fine, Anju Mata Ji. You were very good. Thank you. All right. So um, today I'm stepping in for uh, uh, the other great speakers like Vrindavan Chandra Prabhu and Devanam Prabhu. So please forgive me because uh, obviously I am I will not be um, as good as they are, but I will try my best. They both had some important meetings and could not um, facilitate today's session, so I was asked to if I could cover for them. So here I am. Um, Let me just get the PowerPoint. One second. Just give me one minute. Let me get my screen up. Uh, 
Okay, can you all see the screen now? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. All right, so we will continue with chapter six and today we are going to discuss um, verse number 16 from chapter six. Let me just get that verse. Sorry, sometimes um, on the PowerPoint, because we've got other things, I can't see the whole verse clearly. So I like to have it on my phone as well. Okay, so um, Bhagavad Gita chapter six, verse number 16. Nati ashnatas tu yogosti, na chaikantam anasnataha, na chati svapnasi lasya, Jagrato naiva charjuna. Translation and purport by Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada ki jai. There is no possibility of one's becoming a yogi or Arjuna if one eats too much or eats too little, sleeps too much or does not sleep enough. Does anybody want to read the purport? Okay, so I will read it. Regulation of diet and sleep is recommended herein for the yogis. Too much eating means eating more than is required to keep the body and soul together. There is no need for men to eat animals because there is an ample supply of grains, vegetables, fruits, and milk. Such simple food stuff is considered to be in the mode of goodness according to the Bhagavad Gita. Animal food is for those in the mode of ignorance. Therefore, those who indulge in animal food, drinking, smoking, and eating food, which is not first offered to Krishna, will suffer sinful reactions because of eating only polluted things. Bunjate te tvab agham papa ye pachanti atma karanat. Anyone who eats for sense pleasure or cooks for himself, not offering his food to Krishna, eats only sin. One who eats sin and eats more than is allotted to him cannot execute perfect yoga. It is best that one eat only the remnants of food stuff offered to Krishna. A person in Krishna consciousness does not eat anything which is not first offered to Krishna. Therefore, only the Krishna conscious person can attain perfection by yoga practice. Nor can one who artificially abstains from eating, manufacturing his own personal process of fasting, practice yoga. The Krishna conscious person observes fasting as it is recommended in the scriptures. He does not fast or eat more than is required, and he is thus competent to perform yoga practice. One who eats more than required will dream very much while sleeping and he must consequently sleep more than is required. One should not sleep more than six hours daily. One who sleeps more than six hours out of 24 is certainly influenced by the mode of ignorance. A person in the mode of ignorance is lazy and prone to sleep a great deal. Such a person cannot perform yoga. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Om Ajnanati Mirandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guru Venamaha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dinabandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrinda Vaneshwari Vrishubhanu Sute Devi Pranumami Hari Priye Vanchakalpaturubhascha Kripa Sindhu Bevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaurabhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale 
ಶ್ರೀಮತೆ ಭಕ್ತಿ ವೇದಾಂತ ಸ್ವಾಮೀತಿ ನಾಮಿನೆ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ದೇವೇ ಗೌರವಾನಿ ಪ್ರಚಾರಿಣೆ ನಿರ್ವಿಶೇಷ ಶೂನ್ಯವಾದಿ ಪಶ್ಚತಾದೇಶತಾರಿಣೆ thank you all for uh, joining us and let's see what we can take from this verse it it seems to be a very very simple um, instructive verse but um, the instructions are quite strong very clear but very strong as well so um, let's see what we can understand so the first thing that we understand is that and dropad keeps talking about it constantly is that the material body is the source of all our miseries <clears throat> the spirit soul actually does not have um, any misery so um in in one of his lectures on this particular verse dropad um compares this that the normal condition of a living entity is a healthy life that's the normal condition disease is because there is some kind of infection there is some kind of contamination that is why there is disease otherwise a normal person will have a healthy body so propad is comparing the present condition that we all find ourselves in the present condition of the material existence as a diseased condition of the soul and what is that disease that disease is that um the body why it why are we saying that the disease of the soul is this body because the soul is separate to the body but we have started thinking of ourselves as this body and somewhere we have forgotten my original identity which is the soul and i have taken on this material identity that i have got i have started to take on and identify myself as this body rather than as the spirit soul and that is why prabhupada is calling it that we the soul the eternal soul is currently in a diseased condition so first of all we have to recognize that we are in a diseased condition and once we recognize that then we need to get out of the disease and that is the process of yoga yoga is to connect with the supreme personality yoga yoga means to join yoga means to join so we have to join back with the supreme personality of godhead because right now we are not in our original um, existence in our original identification why is it that we have to join back with the supreme personality of godhead and i'm sure we all have heard this analogy a number of times but again it's a it's a yes it's an analogy that we've heard a number of times but we need to apply it so prabhupad says the reason why we need to um form that connection again is because without that connection the spirit soul has no value exactly like if your finger gets detached cut off from the body and is fallen on the ground that finger has got absolutely no value that finger will eventually be just thrown away because it has no value when it is separated from the body the same way because we have forgotten the soul, sorry there's some background sound coming can i request everybody to please mute yourselves so so the same way because right now we have disconnected ourselves in a sense we've not disconnected because we cannot ever lose our connection with krishna but we have forgotten our connection with krishna 
we have forgotten that we are eternal uh, spirit souls we are not this body we have started to associate with this body and that is why we have forgotten our connection with krishna and that is why we are right now in a diseased condition and krishna consciousness is the hospital which is going to cure us of this diseased condition so in the bhagavad gita krishna says to arjuna see in the verse 2.11 krishna says to arjuna um shri bhagavan uvacha so the translation is that the lord the blessed lord is saying while speaking learned words you are mourning for what is not worthy of grief those who are wise lament neither for the living nor the dead so here in the chapter um, two of Bhagavad Gita, when Arjuna is refusing to fight with the Kauravas because he is saying, how can I kill these people who are my um, relatives, my brothers, my grandfather, my teacher, you know, my um, elders, how can I fight them? And at that time, um, Krishna is saying to Arjuna and obviously through Arjuna telling all of us that you are mourning for what is not worthy of grief because these people, these Kauravas, these brothers that you're saying, your grandfather, your teacher, you are identifying with the body, but they are not the body. They are the souls and they are all eternal. There is no point in lamenting for somebody that is eternal. So what we have also started doing is because we are identifying this with this material body, so then we identify with the extended eyes in the sense that my family, my children, my wife, my you know, relatives, my house, my everything. So all of this I start identifying with and I start making relations with, you see? And, and in, in that process, we are actually forgetting uh, the true purpose of life. And we are all trying to uh, progress materially, get lot and lot of um, uh, things which we can use for our sense gratification. But we are forgetting the actual essence of human life. We are forgetting where the spirit souls, we are forgetting our connection with Krishna. Uh, Prabhupada goes on to explain that the whole world, they are posing themselves as highly advanced in education, science, philosophy, you know, politics, and so many things. And very interesting analogy he uses here. He says, you know, the, the vulture, the vulture can really, sorry, again, there's a lot of sound. The vulture can fly very, very high. It can fly really high. And it has got such sharp eyes that from that height, it can see it, what it needs for its um, food. Now, the point is, what is the object of its focus? The object of its focus, as we all know, the food for the vulture is a dead body. So the object of the focus is just the dead body. Similarly, all of us, we are striving to go very high, whether it is academically, you know, get very, very good education, or whether earn money or be very powerful in politics, or, you know, in, in science, you know, or, or like, go to the moon planet and go, you know, wherever else. What is the objective? The objective is the same how am I going to enjoy my senses? How am I going to fulfill the wants and desires of this body? That's all. So like the vulture's focus is only on the dead body, my focus, our focus is simply on this body. You know, like the famous verse, ahara nidra bhai maitunancha. Samanyan eta pashubi samanarasam. That is, that even an animal, 
focuses on eating, mating, sleeping, and defending. And if I am also doing the same, then there is no difference between me and the animal. I am exactly like the animal. But the human being has been given higher intelligence. The human being has been given this intelligence to question, why am I here? What happens to me after I die? What is this just the life that I continue on the cycle of birth and death? Is there anything more to it? So these are the things that a human being should be asking. But today, the material world is such that it is only focused on advancing in such a way that it can fulfill the senses of the body. So what we have to understand is that this body is the reason why we are in the miserable condition. And this body is temporary. It's not permanent. That is something, whether you come to Krishna consciousness or no, everybody knows that this body is temporary. It is going to end eventually. And this um, beautiful verse from the Bhagavatam, 5.5.4 um, says, Nunam pramatta kurute vikarma yad indriya pritaya apranoti nasadhu manye yeta atmanoyam ashan api kleshada ashadeha. Translation When a person considers sense gratification the aim of life, he certainly becomes mad after materialistic living and engages in all kinds of sinful activity. He does not know that due to his past misdeeds, he has already received a body which, although temporary, is the cause of his misery. Actually, the living entity should not have taken on a material body, but he has been awarded the material body for sense gratification. Therefore, I think it not befitting an intelligent man to involve himself again in the activities of sense gratification by which he perpetually gets material bodies one after the other. So the Bhagavatam is saying that already because of our past misdeeds, we have been given this material body. If we don't learn and repeat the same mistakes again, then we will again be given a material body and we don't know what body we will get. It could be anybody, it could be an animal, it could be a tree, it could be a worm, it could be a demigod, it could be anybody, but we are still in the same cycle because this material body is temporary and the spirit soul is eternal. So because I am in a diseased condition, I need to get out of the disease. However, we also should realize that although this body is a temporary, we still have to look after it. Like if we are using a car from going to from place A to place B or whatever else, if we don't maintain the car, the car will break down and it will not serve the purpose. Likewise, if we do not look after this body, this body is meant to perform Krishna conscious activities, to perform devotional service to Krishna. But we, if we don't look after the body, then it will not be able to perform the duties that it is meant to. So the idea is that one does not get too attached to the body. But because with this body, we have the opportunity to perform Krishna conscious activities, we should try and keep it fit. So here it comes the whole idea of yoga. Yoga is meant to keep our body um, fit so that we can perform Krishna conscious activities. And like in the verse, it says that whenever we have to perform any kind of um, yoga or any kind of spiritual practices, if we are not regulated, then we cannot do it. You know, even if we don't come to um, the spiritual part, Anybody on this, on this forum or anybody else, you must have seen and heard that when somebody is going to the gym, when somebody wants to, you know, um, do like even take up uh, sports, you know, um, athletics or whatever, one has to be very, very uh, focused on what, on, on your diet, on your exercise, 
on you know uh, your mental well-being all of that so likewise when we want to perform spiritual activities we cannot um eat too much or eat too little you know rest too much or rest too little so we have to eat good healthy palatable food and in the purport propa very clearly is saying that animal food is not meant for us that is sinful and if we eat that then we will incur sinful reactions that is not meant for us very clearly in the purport propa very strongly saying that one must actually only eat krishna prasad which i know sometimes is not possible um sometimes it is you know you 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 do want to eat other things but ideal the ideal situation is that one must only eat krishna prasad food that has been offered to krishna by which you will not incur any sinful reactions likewise you must sleep enough you must not sleep too much or too little so the whole point here is that balance is the key one has to have balance sometimes we may say that you yeah, i'm eating only krishna prasad and you know if some if let's say for prasad there is gulab jamuns and i love gulab jamuns and i'm going to have 20 gulab jamuns that's not good you know yes i'm i'm having krishna prasad but that does not mean that i go overboard so balance is the key one has to uh realize that i eat only how much is required for my well being you know also at times it happens that uh, because i have to i have got my material duties to perform and i also have my spiritual activities like my chanting and my reading and i don't have enough time so i'm not sleeping enough i'm sleeping late i'm waking up really early you know i'm trying to catch up with things but then that will have, have an effect on your body on your health and eventually it will have an effect on your spiritual and material responsibilities and thus it is very important that one maintains the balance yes with practice it eventually you will come to a stage like prabhupad says 6 hours of sleep is enough you know so one may at the moment not be at that stage but with a little practice with time you will come to the stage where you know you will know and every body is different every individual is different so you will know for yourself what is what works for me what should my diet be how much sleep do i need you know how much rest do i need um do i need to rest um you know uh, in between during the day you know that everything one one has to listen to one's own body so the whole idea is that one should not uh go to one extreme or the other um also one should not falsely when one's body is not ready falsely try to renounce things uh take it slowly one cannot suddenly uh become like the exalted devotees who are able to renounce everything because they have reached that stage and um again uh we will look at an example there are many examples in our scriptures of um you know great exalted devotees who have reached a stage where they have been able to renounce everything um you know so let's let's look at one example here so we have ragunath das goswami ragunath das goswami is one of the um six goswamis uh, who were associates of lord chaitanya very very exalted devotees now especially the story of ragunath das goswami he was the son of a very very rich man and um, he tried to leave home and go in the association of mahaprabhu a couple of times but he was not successful every time he was brought back by his father in fact eventually he was even married off um so that you know the idea was that if he is married then he will not want to leave home he will not want to uh go on the spiritual journey and he will focus on his material responsibilities and duties but ragunath das goswami um managed to leave home because he was um his calling was to be in the association of mahaprabhu and he left home and he went to um jagannath puri and um 
while in Jagannath Puri, his father being such a rich man used to send um, some money and he also sent four servants to look after the needs of Raghunath Das Goswami. So he was being sent some money and he had these servants. And you know, um, um, the Goswami thought, all right, I will use this money to serve the sannyasis here. And he would uh, make um, nice prashad and you know, invite the sannyasis for a feast. So that way he was using the money in the right way. But eventually he came to a realization that you know, um, I'm trying to renounce, I'm trying to get away from these material things. So I don't need this. So he's, uh, he refused, he stopped taking the money and he stopped, he sent these four servants back. So uh, Mahaprabhu asked his associate, um, Swarup Damodar, he said, you know, um, why is it that, um, you know, Raghunath Das Goswami is not inviting me anymore for a feast? And Swarup Damodar, I think it was Swarup Damodar, said that, well, he has stopped um, accepting the money from his father because he's realized that, you know, he's renouncing, so he stopped accepting the money. So Mahaprabhu asked, so what does he do now? Like, how does he um, look after himself, feed himself? So he said he stands at the door of um, Jagannath temple and when the pujaris or the brahmanas are leaving the temple, you know, they offer him some prashad or, you know, leftover um, food or whatever, and that's how he's surviving. Um, so Mahaprabhu was happy with that. Um, and then eventually after a few days, Mahaprabhu did not see Raghunath Das Goswami standing at the door of the temple. And he asked again, where is he? I don't see him here. Um, and then the reply was, the answer that he got was that he realized that I'm, you know, I'm standing here like, a, these are the words that Prabhupada uses when he says the story. He says, I'm standing here like a prostitute trying to, you know, um, ask for things. So, so he stopped doing that. So then Mahaprabhu said, so then what does he do? So he said, you know, whatever is like thrown away, the, you know, the grains that has gone bad or is not used, um, he takes those grains and he tries to satisfy himself. And eventually, obviously, then it came to a stage where he was um, eating one day, not eating the other. And, you know, it, it progresses like that. Uh, then he, he even stopped that. He used to have just have some uh, milk or butter or something like that. The point here is the, the point of the story and the moral of the story here is that we should not try and imitate such exalted personalities, right? Because uh, not all of us can be like that, can be such uh, renounced uh, people. However, we also should realize that there is no possibility of one becoming a yogi till one reaches the stage where one understands that um, just fulfilling my senses or looking after my sense gratification is uh, not life. If I want to become a yogi, meaning if I want to connect with Krishna, if I want to remember my forgotten true identity, then I have to regulate my senses. And regulating my senses starts first with the tongue. The most important thing to control is my tongue. So it is my eating that I need to control. And that is the whole um, essence of this verse. It is just a little past 30, so I will stop here. Um, if there are any questions or queries or realizations or comments, please unmute yourselves and you can share your realization. Yes, anybody? No questions, no comments, that's good. Um, I believe uh, Santosh Mataji um, is going to sing a bhajan. Hare Krishna Mataji, yes, that's right, thank you. No problem. Um, Santosh Mataji, uh, sorry, sorry, just before we go to you, just, uh, just a comment on the chat is, it is difficult to consider some people as eternal soul given a perception of them based on experiences. 
I think I'm too conditioned to view all equally. Surabhi Mataji, that is very true. It's not just you. All of us are very conditioned. And we find it very difficult to view everybody equally. And in the Bhagavad Gita, there is a verse that um, Pandita Samadarshina, where it says that when you reach that stage, you are able to view a, a Brahmin, a dog, a dog eater as the same because you are actually seeing the soul and seeing the super soul in each and every living entity. So yes, it is difficult, but that is the stage where all of us are striving to be. Uh, it may seem impossible right now, but honestly, as you progress, you will, we all are trying. There are times when we can, there are times when we can, can't, but we all have to try. That's it. I'm sorry, you've added one more comment. Um, you know, so much of the teachings in these texts, yes, we see a lot of bias, lack of integration, mockery of the poor or the simple in society, lack of empathy. Yes, but what you also have to realize, Surabhi Mataji, is that there is so much of teaching of the text, but what percentage of human society is taking these teachings? That is a problem. And that is what Prabhupada wanted. Prabhupada, you know, like how you are feeling that there is, you know, harshness of life. There was a time when Prabhupada was in the car and he was, he was being driven. This was in America. He was being driven somewhere. And he, when he saw all these people just generally on the streets, just rushing around doing whatever activities that they were doing, he had tears in his eyes. And when he was asked what, what is wrong, he said, you know, it is so sad that these people don't really know the true meaning of life and they are just rushing around and are so have become slave to this material life. So that is why it is the responsibility of people like you and me to try and spread Krishna consciousness, to make people understand that you're not this body, don't treat another person as, you know, like Prabhupada gives an analogy, very nice analogy about a man who was in a very expensive car. And there was another man, he was talking about India, and he said that there was another man in a rickshaw. Don't know if all of you have heard rickshaw, auto rickshaw. And this man in the car, when the rickshaw, you know, came in his way, like it, you know, it came in front of the car, and the man says to him, he calls out to him, oh, rickshaw, get out of my way. So you see, he was identifying the driver of the rickshaw with the rickshaw. Like that, what we have started doing is identifying our soul with the body. That is why these teachings of the Bhagavad Gita and the message of Krishna consciousness is so important. If we want to change the world, we have to start from us, from you and me from each individual. Otherwise, we cannot expect that the world will change. So yes, we see a lot of harshness around us and that should give us the impetus that should push us to try and change ourselves and then slowly try and change people around us and hopefully the whole world. That is why Mahaprabhu said that in every town and village, the Sankirtan movement should be spread. So hope that kind of answers not answers i know it was just a comment so i hope that kind of satisfies you but yeah i totally understand wh where you're coming from thank you so much thank you no problem and sorry and i also had just one question you know since yeah the, you know some people are from the school of thought that you know some some animals are meant for the dining mm -hmm. table yeah mm -hmm. and because they need to eat you know and they are born and brought up in that way you know mm -hmm. so and <laughs> i remember you know up to a certain age, even I used to have meat. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I came here, and I think for the past uh, 10 years or so, I, 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 I don't indulge mm -hmm. in the meat eating. Although, mm -hmm. you know, uh, but I remember being, you know, mocked at and laughed at subtly, not openly, of course. So if, if uh, anyone laughs at openly, of course, we have, you know, our uh, things to say to back, uh, back to them. But in subtle ways, you know, being mocked at, you know, Oh, you don't eat meat. Oh, what kind of, I mean, you know, how do you change their thought process, you know? Okay. You so, so, Surbhi Mataji, I will share. close to me, you know, uh, still, you know, yeah. you go out and they're like, you know, oh, oh, tu to ve uh, vegetarian hai, you know, we'll yeah. have to order something veggie for you, you know. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. It still goes on. I mean, it's been donkey's years, but the comments still go on. So, how do we change at least the per uh, perception, if not their thought pro uh, process? 
but at least the perception. I'm not asking from a KC point of view. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I'm no, not a me... follower or anything, but uh, I just wanted uh, your uh, opinion. You yeah. Know, this. No, let me let me share something of my own personal story. So before I came to Krishna consciousness, I myself was a non-vegetarian and through and through non-vegetarian, not just like, yeah, it wasn't every day, but yeah. And my take was the same as exactly what you're saying. Coming from a science background, my take was that it's a life, it's a food cycle, food chain where one eats the other and the other eats the other. And in the Bhagavatam also it says that, yes, you know, the four-legged is eaten by the two-legged and so and so. Yes, it's there. How I changed, and I will tell you this, and I, I don't know if it makes any, it, it helps you in any way. When I started my journey and I was doing the Gita Life course, and the brahmachari who was teaching us this course told us one story. And that story just changed my, uh, my mind. Because when otherwise people would say to me, you know, oh, one must be a vegetarian. I always gave this science thing about the food chain. And I said, no, it, you know, it doesn't make sense to me. So he was telling us this story. And I'm sure at, when you've gone to the manor, you've seen these, we've got these, uh, um, these ducks over there at the manor. I don't know if you've seen them, but near the pond, there are lots of ducks and Earlier, when we didn't have the car park so much in use, these ducks would wander off everywhere. And, you know, they would make things um, dirty and all of that stuff. And then once, um, whenever we had weddings, the guest would complain that, you know, it, this area is so dirty. We get off our cars and our shoes get dirty and all of that stuff. So um, whenever there was a wedding, the brahmacharis were asked, that, you know, can you just, you know, um, kind of guide the ducks away from the car park so that they don't come there. And um, he was telling us the story that they were doing that. And when, you know, when he went close to one of the ducks, obviously, you know, they are scared. He said that I could literally see the fear in her eyes. He said, you see, he said, I could literally see the fear in her eyes. And there are people who say that animals don't have feelings. When he said this story, and he said that I could see the fear in her eyes, it just struck me. And I thought to myself, the only reason why I have non-vegetarian food is to satisfy the, the taste, my taste, the taste of my tongue. It is not because I need it to survive. I can survive even if I don't eat that. But I am doing this just for my satisfaction without realizing that these animals have got feelings. They feel the pain, they feel the hurt. When you're separating the child from the mother, the animal, the cow, you can feel the pain. Why can't I see that? I'm only doing this for satisfying myself. And immediately, immediately I gave up non-vegetarian food completely. For me, it wasn't like a sudden, it, was, it wasn't like a progressive thing. It happened just like that. I just gave it up. Now, I come from a family where my brothers, my parents are Vaishnavs, but my brothers, they still have non-vegetarian food. When I go to India and I stay at their houses sometimes, children will, you know, like my children also don't have non-vegetarian anymore. And they also gave it up of their own accord because they also understood. But the cousins will still talk to my daughter. They call her Didi. She's the elder one, but they call her, oh, Didi, what fun, you know. You, you, there's no fun anymore of going out to restaurants to eat because you don't eat non-vegetarian food. You don't eat this, you know. But the thing is, she takes it. She takes it, she understands it, that, you know, we all are on our respective journeys, Surabhi Mataji, you need to understand that, that this person who is saying these things to you has his own journey, you have your own journey. And so don't let anybody, when they say things to you, don't let it affect you in any way. It's fine if they're saying it. Because remember that 10 years back, you were in the same place as them. Something happened and you changed. Something may happen in their life and they may change. It may happen now. It may happen after five years, 10 years, or maybe next life. But give them that compassion. Give them that understanding. So let them be. It's all right. Let them say whatever. You know why you've done that. Yeah. And there is no need to give any explanation. This is your belief, mm -hmm. your principle. Follow it with the understanding and compassion that they have not reached that stage they have not reached that level of understanding. So it's fine.
so don't be upset don't no, be upset. No, no no thanks so much i'm not upset just you know yeah it makes me laugh now you know you know still, yeah. you know um these thoughts still come into of course of course now. i don't want to change them i don't want to change anyone but yeah. it's like i want a more openness or acceptance of everything yes so this is so, this is the way yeah, this is the way have compassion that you know they are on their own yoga ladder they will eventually hopefully fingers crossed with your association also come to the higher level that's our that's our responsibility that try and influence people around us we can try that's it you know um i'll tell you a very small pastime um probat sister probat sister was you know she, she was married and she was a devotee and a vaishnav but her husband was a uh, uh, meat eating and she said to probat what do i do and you know what probat said to her his advice was you have to perform the duties of a wife so you cook for him what he wants you give him the food then you have a shower and then you cook for the deities see that was his advice so we have to learn from this all right okay i'm sorry i'm rushing a little bit because i know santosh mata ji is waiting to sing but there is another comment the comment is we need to eat to survive most of the world is not aware of concept of prashad are they committing sin well yes we have to realize that we've studied karma in the third chapter of bhagavad gita whatever actions we perform we are going to get reactions for it be it good or bad and if we are doing some actions which is not correct according to the uh, scriptures then yes we are committing sin and we will get the results of it um the analogy that propad uses is that a child doesn't know that a fire will burn his finger but that does not mean that the fire will not burn the fire is not going to think that this is just a child so i will not burn him the nature of the fire is that it will burn so whether you do something knowingly or unknowingly if it is a sin you will incur reaction for it okay that's that and then i have another comment um jay prabhu why is fasting not mentioned as an austerity of the body in chapter 17 of bhagavad gita now that's an interesting question jay prabhu but i will really have to refer to the exact verse that you are mentioning here because in other places um we read that yes fasting is um an austerity and it is also uh, yes it is a sacrifice that we are performing to please lord krishna so i'll have to go to the exact verse to be honest before i really answer that so um yeah again another comment um i am not aware of a concept of prashad so sin it is maybe um i can give charity of food but submitting food before having something very new for me but good yes um so in krishna consciousness we are taught that we should offer um whatever it is that we eat and i'll be honest with you not just krishna consciousness a lot of families in india whether they are krishna conscious or no um because i got married into such a family when i got married into this family whatever they cooked was naivedya whatever was cooked was offered to the um on the altar to the deities on the altar before they honored it so whatever they ate was prashad although they were not vaishnavas but they followed this and i know of many families in india who uh, whatever they cook is offered and then they eat it but in krishna consciousness we strongly recommend that anything that you make in the house uh, please offer it to krishna it does not mean that you need to have a deity of krishna it does not mean that you know only if you have like a proper altar and you're performing all you know the regulations that you can offer even just have a picture of krishna and whatever you cook offer it to krishna you know say that this is this is for you like you know when you go to um in india when you go to haridwar or you go for a holy bath in the ganga you take the water of the ganga and offer it back to ganga is that right like you're not doing anything it's it's understanding that krishna whatever i have is yours you have given it to me and i offer it back to you please have it and then let me have your remnants let me have your prashad so 
That way I purify myself. That is the whole idea. So even if you don't have um, an altar, even if you don't have like, you know, um, a, you know, a deities, just have a picture of um, Krishna, Radha Krishna and offer whatever you cook in the house and start, start that process. Of course, there are various mantras and all, but you know, let's not even go to that. Just normal, just pray to Krishna, just with a, with a pure heart, just say, you know, Krishna, this is for you. I have made this for you. Please have this, you know, and then, and then have that. So then that becomes prashad. Okay. Um, one second now, uh, coming to Jay Prabhu's question. Um, yes, 17.14, I am there now. Austerity of body consists in worshiping of the Supreme Lord. That's good. Okay. Yes. Okay. Now, um, just give me one minute and I'm going to go to today's verse because today's verse talks about um, sorry. Um, uh, so today's verse, uh, Jay Prabhu talks about the Krishna conscious person observes fasting as it is recommended in the scriptures. He does not fast or eat more than is required, but he does fasting. So it is talking about abstaining from eating and it is talking about um, um, fasting during when it is recommended and fasting is one of the austerities that we are performing. However, to me, what I understand is that uh, it is not an austerity of the body in the sense that what Prabhupada says is that we are, we are not fasting uh, uh, without following what is recommended in the scriptures. When you are doing something to like, you know, to a degree where it is going to harm your body, that is not being recommended. But fasting also is an austerity as far as I understand. And I've read in other places. So give me time and I will look up the reference where it says that fasting is also an austerity. And I will come back to you if that is okay, Jay Prabhu. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, can you find out which scriptures uh, mention fasting as well? Yes, yes, definitely. I will definitely because I know in the Bhagavad Gita also it is said, but I just need to look at where and what and I will come back to you. I'm, I'm making a note of this. I will come back to you. I can't find any mention of fasting in any of other verses. No, um, problem. no problem. I will look at at least because I know that it is mentioned in lectures by Prabhupada, it is mentioned in other places, but I will have to look it up. All right. Okay, thank you. No problem. Sorry, sorry, Santosh Mataji. This is the last one that I'm going to take. I'm not taking any more questions now. There's a question from, um, it's a direct message. So I guess um, I'll just um, not say the name, but it says, Hare Krishna Mataji, please clarify food cooked with onion and garlic in curry is not allowed to be offered as prashad. Yes, that is right. We, um, in Krishna consciousness, we do not eat um, any food that is cooked, cooked in onion and garlic because onion and garlic is supposed to be foods in the mode of ignorance. And um, because they are food in the mode of ignorance, that is why uh, it is recommended and it is asked of us as one of the regulations that we do not eat onion and garlic. And thus, ideally, because we eat only Krishna Prashad and we are not supposed to eat this, we don't offer it to Krishna. All right? Okay. So that's it. I'm going to stop um, here. If there are any more questions, please just message me because um, Santosh Mataji has been waiting. Santosh Mataji, um, what was the bhajan? I know you said um, Krishna Govind. I Radhe Govinda. Yes, there, there are no lyrics to it. It's just a repetition of those two words. Oh, right. Okay. No problem. Yes. No problem. That's fine. Please go ahead, Mataji. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. I'm going to sing one of my favorite bhajans, Radhe Govinda. Thank you. Radhe Radhe Govinda, Govinda Radhe. 
राधे राधे गोविंद गोविंद राधे 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 राधे गोविंद बोलो राधे गोविंद राधे गोविंद बोलो राधे गोविंद राधे राधे गोविंद गोविंद राधे 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 गोविंद गोविंद राधे जय राधे जय राधे राधे जय राधे जय श्री राधे जय राधे जय राधे राधे जय राधे जय श्री राधे 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 गोविंद गोविंद 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 राधे राधे गोविंद बोलो राधे गोविंद राधे गोविंद बोलो राधे गोविंद जय राधे गोविंद बोलो राधे गोविंद राधे गोविंद बोलो राधे गोविंद राधे गोविंद बोलो राधे गोविंद हरे कृष्णा thank you santosh mata ji i didn't realize i was on mute thank you um just before we end um jay prabhu i have uh, just in this short span just seen one thing which i will share with you so this is um a question why is fasting important and the answer was that fasting is recommended as tapasya or austerity because it helps us control our senses and if our senses are out of control and unregulated we won't be able to come to the mode of goodness so um and shila propad when he was giving um, a lecture on bhagavad gita 7.9 um he said this he said tapasya means to undergo voluntarily some inconveniences of this body because we are accustomed to enjoy bodily senses and tapasya means voluntarily to give up the idea of sense gratification that is tapasya just like ekadashi ekadashi one day fasting fortnight that is also tapasya or fasting in some other auspicious day that tapasya is good even for health and what to speak of advancing in krishna consciousness so we should accept this tapasya there are many prescribed days for fasting we should observe so this is one of the things that uh, propad said there are other conversations and um, i will try and do a bit more research into this but um, i hope this kind of helps you as well that propa did call it um, austerity tapasya okay all right so we will stop here now thank you all of you for joining and um, hopefully i shall see you all um, next week vanchakal patru bascha Jai Hari Krishna. Thank you very much, Mata Ji. Hari Krishna. Hari Krishna. Thank you. Hari Krishna. Thank, Thank you, Mata Ji. Hari Krishna. Hari Krishna. Thank you. Hari Krishna.